Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Charles Vera. I'm the director of the Rotman Institute of Philosophy, and I have uh, a very pleasant task today of introducing uh, our, uh, our speaker. Uh, Michael Parker is professor of, of bioethics and director of the Ethos Center at the University of uh, Oxford. And he has a couple of uh, areas of major research interest. The first is in the ethics of uh, collaborative global health research. And to that end, he coordinates uh, <coughs> the Global Health Bioethics Network, which is a program to carry out ethics research and build ethics capacity across uh, the UK's Welcome Trust major overseas programs in Vietnam, Malawi, uh, Thailand, Laos, Kenya, and South Africa. He also uh, has a, a major research interest that we're going to hear about today in ethical aspects in the, in the clinical use of, of, of genetics. And since 2001, he's coordinated the Gen Ethics Club, a national ethics forum for health professionals and genetics laboratory staff in the United Kingdom to discuss uh, ethical issues arising in their day-to-day -day practice and, uh, and to share good practice. Uh, he's recently published a book, uh, very recently, in 2012, uh, with Cambridge University Press, entitled Ethical Problems and uh, Genetic uh, Practice. He's a member of a number of uh, prominent committees, including the Nottville Council of Bioethics Working Group on Mitochondrial Donation, the UK Royal College of Physicians Committee on Ethics and Practice, and the Medical Research Council's Ethics Regulation and Public Involvement uh, Committee. Today, he's going to speak to us about Moral craft in the genetics clinic and the laboratory. Please join me in welcoming Professor McClure. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, I'd, I'd like to begin by thanking Robert Institute and uh, in particular uh, Charles for inviting me to speak here today. Um, it's a great honor to be here, a real pleasure to be um, here in London and my first time in Canada, so thanks, thanks very much for that. When, when Charles and I first spoke about this lecture, we agreed that I would speak on the topic of ethical problems in genetics practice. And I'm going to do that, but I'm going to try to find, I'm going to find my way into this topic in two quite unlikely ways. The first of these is with the idea that it might be interesting to think about ethics in relation to a commitment, in relation to the commitment to doing a job well for its own sake. That is, in relation to the idea of craftsmanship. Hit the middle button. Middle button. Okay. Okay, so, in, the idea, in relation to the idea of craftsmanship. The idea that ethics and craftsmanship might be related in productive ways is, has a long history. Most recently, the American sociologist Richard Sennett has explored this idea in relation to contemporary social life in his book, The Craftsman. Sennett writes, craftsmanship may suggest a way of life that wanes with the advent of industrial society, but this is misleading. Craftsmanship names an enduring basic human impulse, the desire to do a job well for its own sake. Craftsmanship cuts a far wide, wider swathe than skilled manual labor. It serves the computer programmer, the doctor, and the artist. Parenting improves when it's practiced as a skilled art, as does citizenship. In all of these domains, craftsmanship focuses on the objective standards, on the thing in itself. Social and economic conditions, however, often stand in the way of the craftsman's discipline and commitment. Schools may provide, fail to provide the tools to do good work, and workplaces may not truly value the aspiration Quality. And though craftsmanship can reward an individual with a sense of pride in work, this reward is not simple. The craftsman often faces conflicting objective standards of excellence. The desire to do something well for its own sake can be impaired by competitive pressure, by frustration, or by obsession. So one theme in this talk today is going to be reflection on the idea of moral craftsmanship and its limits in the context of chemical genetics. I'll come back to craftsmanship later. My second way of thinking about ethics in genetics begins with an account of an ethics discussion group, the Genetics Club, which I established with three <coughs> genetics professionals in 2001. When we, when we set up the Genetics Club, it was intended as a one-off, one-day workshop. 
bringing together genetic professionals from around the United Kingdom to discuss the ethical issues arising in their day to day work. But the club has since gone on to develop a life of its own. There have now been 30 genetics club meetings around the country since that first meeting, and it's not much of an exaggeration to say that the genetics club has become something approximating a national institution in UK genetics. Those who attend the genetics club meetings include nurses, counsellors, uh, clinical geneticists, and laboratory staff. In, in total, more than 750 people, over 450 different individuals, have attended the genetics club which is a very significant proportion of the clinical genetics community in the United Kingdom. Over time, the format of the meetings has evolved into one structured around cases presented by genetics professionals, followed by open discussion. And I facilitate that discussion. The discussion tends to be free-flowing. More than 250 cases have been formally presented overall, but the discussion following these presentations has inevitably prompted wide-ranging exploration of many more cases, anecdotes, and issues. So it's a kind of thing that spreads and has a life of its own. Now, the genetics club has received no external funding. And interestingly, perhaps, in retrospect, we've never applied for any funding. A small, the, the people who attend pay a small fee to cover the cost of the room hire and lunch and pay their own travel expenses, often out of their own pocket. And given this, it's interesting to reflect on why it is that the genetics club has been so popular. And it's the opportunity to engage with this question, which is my main reason for including this group uh, in this talk. Why is it that genetics professionals come to the genetics club in large numbers at their own expense? Why do they get, what do they get out of it? And why, moreover, do their line managers support them in this and allow them to take time out of their work? Given the busy working lives of health professionals and the pressure of the demands of the, on the units in which they work, this isn't easy to understand. Perhaps unsurprisingly, in many cases, attendance at the genetics club is initially prompted by an encounter with a particularly difficult case. This is reflected in the fact that the cases genetic professionals bring along to the club tend to be presented as practical ethical problems. So one reason why genetics professionals attend is that they've encountered a problem and would like to discuss this with colleagues and with an ethicist. Here's an example of a case presented at the genetics club, and this is verbatim, more or less, on my notes at least. I've got a young patient with a family history of Huntington's who wants to have a test to see whether she's going to be affected by the disease as she gets older. She's worried because she knows that her paternal grandmother has it. During counselling, my, my patient, patient disclosed that she's an identical twin. She says that her twin sister is not aware of the family history and says that she does not want her sister to know because she doesn't think that she could cope with this knowledge, particularly because the disease is untreatable. When I told her that I was reluctant to do the test without, on her without discussing it with her sister, because the fact that they're identical twins means that a test would also be on a test on the twin, she said that she didn't want her sister to be involved. To reassure me, she promised that whatever the test results, she would not disclose this. The other problem I've got is that in addition to being a test on her twin, the test, if positive, would also be a test on her father, who she says also does not know that she's coming for testing. I've tried to encourage her to talk to her sister and father about the test, but she says that she's not able to do this. I feel I've got a duty of care to my patient, but I'm also worried about her sister and father, even though I've never met them. But whilst the explanation I gave a moment ago that genetic professionals come to the genetics club because they're encountering problems such as the one I've just described, and this, this seems right for many, for many attendees, it doesn't, I think, account for why it is that so many genetics professionals from such diverse backgrounds continue to attend, even when they don't have a case to present or to discuss. Why do they do this? So one of my aims in this talk, as I've already said, is to try to begin to answer this question. <coughs> the, this, but this is probably the most boring slide to show you're ever going to see. And essentially, the point of it is just to let you know where I am in the talk. <laughs> work, go through these six, six concepts. Now, my reason for introducing these two ideas together, that of the genetics club and of craftsmanship, is because on reflection, it scares me that a key motivation for continuing or repeat attendance to the genetics club for many has been something like a commitment to good practice. The majority of those who attend or participate appear to share a deep commitment to doing their job well for its own sake and recognize that this requires not only that they think hard about the clinical or medical aspects of their day-to-day -day practice, but also a commitment to what might perhaps be thought of as the moral craft of genetics. 
Are we going to argue that it's something like this which motivates them to take seriously the problems they encounter in their own practice and informs their willingness and interest to learn about and discuss the problems encountered by others? Now, it's against this background of weaving together these two threads of thoughts about craftsmanship and the genetics club that I want to move on now to explore the moral and ethical features of genomics, uh, genetics practice. <coughs> Genetics is frequently in the media and by policymakers and academics identified as an idea as an, an area of contemporary life permeated by profoundly challenging ethical and social issues. But for genetics professionals themselves, such challenges are relatively infrequent and are, and are experienced as contrasting with the broad background of day to day practice, which is relatively stable and unproblematic. Clinical genetics has been well established in the UK at least since the 1960s, and over time, Genetic, clinical geneticists, nurses, and genetic counselors have developed widely accepted and effective ways of uh, models of good practice. Patients are seen, histories are taken, screening is offered, treatments are given, and relatives are informed as genetics professionals come to care for successive generations and multiple branches of families. It is perhaps paradoxical that one of the things that the development of the genetics club and the presentation of the cases there as problematic has served to highlight the most powerfully is the extent to which ethical problems emerge against and need to be understood in the context of a rich background of undeniably complex but largely agreed day-to-day -day practice. Most of the time, genetics professionals don't worry about moral problems or see their practices as problematic. They just get on with their job. <coughs> now, to say that practice in genetics tends not to be characterized on a daily basis by ethical conflict, controversy, or ambiguity, or by a constant requirement for reflection and critique is not, of course, to say that it's not moral. The fact that practice, practices can be deeply moral, even when they're not obviously problematic, is sometimes overlooked by people who identify ethics with conflict, disagreement, or uncertainty. But one of the striking things about the discussion of cases at the genetics club has been the way that the world of the genetics professional emerges as richly moral, even when not characterized by what might conventionally be seen as ethical issues. In their day-to-day -day work, genetics professionals make not only scientific or clinical judgments about, for example, the quality of the evidence for one intervention in comparison with another, or about the interpretation of a particular dysmorphology and its implications for future health, but also value judgments. <coughs> Such judgments are often explicit. An example of this might be a situation in which a genetics professional, a particular professional, expresses a view in a case conference that she considers prenatal testing to be inappropriate for a minor condition. And sometimes value judgments are explicitly enshrined in guidelines or in the law. For example, where professional guidelines state that the patient's confidentiality may be breached when there's a risk of death or serious harm. In many cases, however, value judgments are not, ex not explicit but are implicit in what seem at first glance to be clinical decisions. For example, genetics professionals may not think of themselves as making value judgments when considering what would be in an incompetent patient's best interest when deciding whether an inherited condition is sufficiently serious to justify prenatal testing, or when making judgments about prioritizing the department's spending on genetic testing, or PGD. Yet these decisions do involve value judgments. Such judgments can also be implicit in practice, in ways which do not have the characteristics of decisions at all. Indeed, perhaps the majority of value judgments are simply built into the genetics professional's day-to-day -day encounters with patients as smooth practices embodying implicit, unspoken values. Among other things, these might include caring about, listening carefully to, and having respect for the values, attitudes, and beliefs of patients, having the courage to be honest, breaking bad news in ways that are appropriate, taking the time to do things well, not rushing, providing support. The day-to-day -day moral practices of genetics professionals, even where, more, even where relatively unproblematic and not uniform, of course, and it's important not to overstate the homogeneity of these. There is a tremendous diversity of values and social and cultural practices, both in patients, professionals, <coughs> and between institutions. It's striking nonetheless, however, I think, that despite the, the existence of diversity, there remains a wide range of relatively, un relatively unproblematized practice, which acts as a stable background against out of which the problems discussed at the genetics club emerge and into which solutions recede. The moral world of the conscientious genetics professional is informed by a number of important and largely shared moral commitments.
the commitment to sharing, the commitment to caring for patients and their families is, for example, shared relatively unquestioningly by all genetics professionals, despite their diversity in other respects. The commitment to the care of the patient is one of the key features of the moral world of the genetics professional. This brings with it, among other things, a commitment to patient-centeredness, respect for the patient's beliefs and values, respect for their wishes, and a broad approach which is sometimes, perhaps confusingly, characterised as non-directive. The commitment to the care of the patient's family, on the other hand, uh, which, is, which is in many respects peculiar to the world of clinical genetics, arises from the fact that information about inherited disorders in the patient, or the finding that they're not at risk, almost inevitably has implications for their relatives. <coughs> Our views about the nature and the strength of the obligations to family members vary greatly, but in general, genetics professionals see themselves as having at least some responsibility to make reasonable efforts to ensure that information is shared with at-risk family members and to enable them to have access to support information, testing and, treat or, and treatment. This commitment manifests itself in encouragement to patients to talk to their relatives, in the writing of letters to be passed on to relatives by the patient, and so on, and can importantly provide, involve providing care and support to family members who are biologically related to the patient, and also to those who are related to them in other ways, perhaps as partners or carers. The complexities of contemporary family <coughs> life in the UK and, and most other places means that there's much interplay and slippage between these two commitments, and their implications work out differently in the context of different patients and different families and in the context of different inherited, inherited disorders. That is, these commitments, whilst broadly shared, require interpretation and judgment in particular cases. What these commitments are taken to require in particular situations, in a particular consultation or counselling session, is guided by experience and rules of thumb, which together make up good practice. Listening, paying attention, being supportive, waiting, allowing time to pass, writing letters to or calling GPs and so on. So the moral world, let me just get some water. So the moral world of the clinical genetics then is characterized by broad areas of relatively stable and unproblematic practice, constituted by moral commitments such as those to the, the care of the patient and the family. And implicit and explicit value judgments manifested in interpreted rules of thumb, material practices such as the way in which information about families is stored, and so on which are, those, are themselves, in practice, largely shared. Now, an interesting story could be told about how it is that such practices, rules of thumb, and shared values, it, integral to a group good practice, emerge over the course of the history of the development of clinical genetics, and how they're maintained within the day-to-day -day practices of genetic professions and passed on from one generation of genetics professionals to the next. That is, about how genetics professionals are introduced to and come to take over the values, commitments, habits, and implicit practices and traditions and views about good practice which characterise the profession of clinical genetics. Now it seems likely too that this involves both explicit and tacit processes. Some of these commitments and other moral practices are likely to have been explicitly taught in medical school or nursing courses or in genetic counselling training and reinforced in, in continuing professional development. Some are explicitly stated in the law or in professional guidelines, such as those on confidentiality or on the genetic testing of children. But much of what counts as good practice, important values and appropriate rules of thumb, is however either not amenable to being taught explicitly, or is taught much more powerfully through the hidden curriculum outside of the ethics seminars, on the wards or in the clinical lectures. Moreover, much of what counts as good practice is likely to involve the kinds of skills attitudes and practices which can be shown but cannot be taught or explained. This is likely to be as true of moral judgment as it is of other areas of medical practice. Just as in surgery, for example, where the surgeons experience judgment that what looks like a case of X, which requires immediate surgery, is in fact a case of Y, which does not require surgery at all, is frequently a skill or judgment learned through experience and close practice with experienced colleagues rather than something explicitly taught. So this is likely to be the case with moral judgment, or at least much moral judgment. This is the way in which young doctors, nurses and counsellors come to learn the character traits and virtues of the good genetics professional. That is, how to relate to, how to speak to, how to listen seriously to and how to care for patients and so on. 
So much of the formation of virtue and character, so central to good practice in the moral world of the genetics professional, is inevitably made possible by personal experience and through engagement with the experience of others, by means, that is, of a kind of moral apprenticeship. This is because what, much of what um, is moral and what counts as good practice emerges from or is implicit practice and is not the product of the application of ethical principles or frameworks to problems or practice. It's established through, through the formation of shared habits of good practice and the growth of practical wisdom. Now to say that it's, it's an important distinction. So now to say that much of the practice of the genetic professional is relatively stable and unproblematic, underpinned by rich inheritance of tacit knowledge and shared approaches to good practice, is not in any sense to suggest that it's uncomplicated or that genetic professionals are not called upon to make complex and difficult value judgments in their day-to-day -day work with patients and families. The complexities of genetics and family life mean that shared practice is only ever at best relatively stable, and commitments are always to some, to some extent provisional. Clinical genetics is a challenging job, and one of the most striking features of the moral world of the genetics professional is the tremendous amount of work required on a daily basis in order to carry out this job successfully, even against the background of relatively stable, unproblematic day-to-day -day practices and commitments. Now, I suggested earlier that the maintenance of the core, relatively widely agreed, and unproblematic commitment to the care of a patient, for example, requires of genetic professionals that they work out, in particular instances, just what such care requires, and what are the, what are the implications of their commitments for what is to can constitute good practice in situations which are both dynamic and complex in new ways. What exactly is required in this particular case, for example, by caring for, by, take, by taking responsibility for, by treating with respect and so on? How and when should break bad news be broken to this patient? When is it appropriate to raise the issue of sharing information with the patient's relatives? Much of this work will be informed by rules of thumb and tacit understanding based on the clinician's experience of what's proved effective in the past and by what he or she has learned from experience of colleagues. Families differ in important ways, but they also have, often have much in common, to which the experience of the genetics professional is relevant and might usefully and appropriately be brought to bear. This means that in many cases, genetics professionals will know how to negotiate their way through these kinds of problems without having to think very hard or long about it. But this will not always be the case. Sometimes genetics professionals will worry about such problems and discuss with their colleagues how best to implement or interpret the principles or commitments of good practice in particular situations or contexts. Furthermore, whilst much of the day-to-day -day practice of the genetics professional will involve making ju judgments in the context of particular patients and families about what is required by the relevant explicit and implicit commitments about what is to constitute good practice in circumstances perhaps never previously encountered in combination with <coughs> long sentence, there are also encounter situations in which there are tensions in practice between competing moral commitments or value judgments. For example, between the care for the patient and the care for the family, or between different conceptions of good practice. Now, in the context of particular families, it's not uncommon for these commitments to pull in different directions and to seem to call for conflicting courses of action. This can arise in situations where patients refuse to share information with their family members, for example, as we've seen in the case earlier. And here, the commitment to caring for the individual patient and respecting his or her confidentiality is in practical tension with the commitment to ensuring that other family members who are at risk and who may benefit from contact with clinical genetics professionals are informed and offered support and advice. In this kind of situation, the successful management of the tension between these two commitments and the achievement of a solution which respects both requires a different kind of work Experienced genetics professionals tend to be extremely good at this. In such situations, the experienced geneticist will counsel the patient, supporting her and offering advice, and whilst remaining steadfastly patient-centered, encourage her to see the importance of sharing information and suggest ways in which this might be possible. This is the pro process of negotiation, mediation, encouragement and support, by means of which genetics professionals make it possible for patients to share information with family members despite their anxiety or initial reluctance to do so. This is how the genetics professional does the work required for it to be possible for her to meet her obligations both to the patient and to the family. And it's the effective carrying out of this work, guided by the use of moral rules of thumb, 
by genetic professionals, which has enabled the commitments underpinning good practice to be met. Good practice is not merely a matter of following rules of thumb or practicing according to agreed principles or commitments. Principles and commitments require interpretation in practice, and the tensions between them need to be managed. Judgments need to be made. What all this means is that the day-to-day -day practice of genetics is characterized by a huge amount of what might be thought of as moral work. And it's this moral work which sustains the ethical commitments underpinning good practice. If much everyday practice in genetics is relatively stable and unproblematic, this is largely made possible and held together by the moral work of genetics professionals. It's not very dramatic, I think. <laughs> it shows a certain amount of progress. <laughs> So the moral work of the genetic professional is largely successful in holding the moral commitments, the moral practices of day-to-day -day genetics together, in sustaining the shared commitments and their enactment in good practice. Nevertheless, there are some situations in which the commitments informing good practice are brought into question and can themselves become an object of concern. And situations, too, in which the moral work by which these commitments are sustained can itself come to be seen as problematic. Against the background of broad agreement, shared practices and continued moral, moral work, these cases are experienced by the genetics professionals who present them and those who come along to listen and discuss them at the genetics club as a particular kind of problem, calling for a particular kind of moral work, the kind of work that I'm going to call ethics. The case which I described earlier is a good example of this, and I'll, I'll read you another one now, just yeah, because I think they're quite interesting. A woman who was trying to get pregnant was recently referred to me because she's a member of a family with a history of a serious x linked disorder. Her cousin is affected. My patient is interested in using PGD to ensure that she doesn't have an affected baby. We didn't have any information about the mutation in the family, so we had to carry out a linkage study to assess her risk. This meant looking at samples from a number of other family members. We were talking about a generation of people in their 50s and over. They were all very happy to provide blood samples. When we tested the samples, however, it was clear that one had no genetic markers in common with anyone else in the family, suggesting adoption, and another showed non-paternity. These results showed that my patient is not at risk of the condition. What should we do? Is it acceptable simply to tell her there's no risk, or does she need to know that she's adopted? The people concerned are now deceased, so it's not possible to ask for their consent to share this information. Now, the cases presented by genetic professionals at the Genetics Club are, to some extent, as I hope to have shown, anomalies. They're examples of situations in, which, situations in which moral work and the conditions which sustain and make moral work possible no longer reassure or convince, where otherwise effective rules of thumb and explicit and explicit commitments no longer provide solutions to the problems encountered, but are seen to generate more problems, or perhaps problems of a different kind. These are not merely the kinds of situations which require the genetics professional to stop, pause, and think carefully about what they're doing. For example, how can I support this patient in ways which make it possible to discuss the risks with their family members? Genetics professionals don't come to genetics club for advice about this kind of problem, even though they clearly call for a significant amount of moral work. The cases they bring to the genetics club are those in which the commitments and principles underpinning good practice and moral work itself are called into question and are themselves problematic. These are the ethical, these are ethical problems, and these are clearly very significant problems for those who take the idea of doing their, doing their job well seriously. For they bring into question and render unstable the very question of what it, what it is to count as good practice. What are the implications of the proceeding for thinking of, of, of ways, of, sorry, of the ways of thinking about the roles of ethics in the day-to-day -day work of genetics professionals and for understanding the relationship between everyday moral practices and ethics. Now, the argument I've been developing thus far might be summarized like this. Genetics professionals have got a job to do. They need to be able to care for patients and their families and to fulfill their other professional obligations without having to reflect upon or deliberate about every aspect of their practice. Were this necessary, it would prove, prove, uh, prove unsettling both for the patient and for genetics professionals themselves, and good practice would be impossible. In genetics, as in any other area of life, this means that much practice is unreflective and embedded in several habits which carry the accumulated valuable experience of the past into the present. 
morality only makes sense in the context of some shared, established practices and values. Problems such as the one I described earlier are, however, an unavoidable part of the day-to-day -day work of the genetic professional. And these problems are frequently acute because genetic professionals have duty of care to particular patients and their families. And decisions often have to be made within tight, uh, tight time constraints, such as, for example, those of pregnancy. Such problems tend to be dynamic. Actors enter into, the, enter into and leave the scene. Patients change their minds. New tests and treatments become available. Genetic professionals have, work, have to work together with a range of different professions across institutional boundaries and within the complexities of contemporary family life. And in, and in any particular complex situation, it's likely that a number of different and often competing values and commitments are going to be relevant. Against this background, the genetic professional needs nevertheless to work out, that is, to make a judgment about what is to count as good practice in a particular context. And because such practice is always to some extent provisional, partial, fluid, and unstable, much of the day-to-day -day practice of the genetics professional will be taken up with what I've referred to as moral work. <clears throat> I suggested that such moral work is often effective at enabling acceptable solutions to these problems to be worked out and the commitments underpinning good practice to be met. Sometimes, however, within the context of the care of particular patients and their families, agreed, everyday agreed and relatively unproblematic moral practices and commitments are transformed into ethical problems, which unsettle the question of what it means to practice clinical genetics well and call for a different kind of work, the kind of work I've called ethics. Such problems tend to persist and to have resonance beyond the individual particular case, and this is one reason why they get presented for deliberation of the genetics club. Now, explaining the relationship between moral practice and ethics this way overlooks something important about craftsmanship. It's important to, to note this. For the genetic professional who's committed to good practice and the moral craft of genetics is not going to be content to wait for the commitments and rules of thumb informing everyday good practice to emerge as ethical problems. That is, to see their role as merely responding to problems which happen to present themselves in the course of their day-to-day -day practice. The genetic professional committed to good practice is someone who sees the act of seeking out of moral and ethical problems as an important part of their commitment to moral craftsmanship. And there are a number of reasons for this. One reason arises out of the genetics professional's recognition that problems they encounter in their day-to-day -day practice are inevitably, to some extent, contingent upon the kinds of patients and families that they just happen to see, the colleagues they happen to work with, and the difficulties they happen to come across. Even if in practice these problems frequently resonate with the experiences of genetics professionals elsewhere, the genetic professional committed to, to moral craftsmanship is not going to be satisfied with an approach which concentrates only on the resolution of ethical problems or challenges emerging in their day-to-day -day practice because to do so would be to mean that a disproportionate role will be played by moral love and the contingencies of day-to-day -day practice in the question of what's to count as an object of ethical concern. Whilst the genetics professional committed to the moral craft of genetics recognises the important role of moral love and acknowledges the value of situations in which the contingencies of everyday practice and the complications of family life prove unsettling of agreed and relatively stable practices, they're going to view this as at least as a, at best incomplete as an approach to ethics. The genetics professional committed to good practice is going to be suspicious of approaches which take the moral and ethical problems of such, pra such practice at face value, at least in part because of her awareness of the fact that much day-to-day -day practice is unreflected, and because of her awareness too of the potential for the moral work which is so central to good practice to obscure as well as to identify important ethical issues, tensions and problems which might otherwise have led to the emergence of key practices and commitments as objects of ethical concern. An example of this might be a situation in which a patient initially refuses to share genetic information with her family members, but as a result of the effective moral work of the genetics professional, supporting, encouraging, counselling and so on, ultimately does in fact pass this information on, leading to a resolution of the tensions between the genetics, commitments, genetics professional's commitments to the care of the family and the care of the patient. Such, such situations have the potential to be troubling for genetics professionals who are committed to more like what I call moral craftsmanship. Because whilst on the one hand, on the one interpretation, moral work has made good practice possible, on another interpretation, the very same moral work has rendered invisible an important moment in which what is to count as good practice 
might have emerged as an opportunity for critical reflection. The genetics professional is going to be wary of approaches to good practice, which identify ethics too closely with conflict, disagreement, and the breakdown of consensus. Because there's a danger that in situations in which there's broad agreement, or where practice runs smoothly, perhaps because moral work has been successful, there may appear to be no important ethical issues to resolve, and no need to question or reflect critically upon practice. The genetics professional is also only too aware of the numerous examples of practices in medicine and elsewhere, which were at one time widely agreed to be good practice, only subsequently to come to be seen as highly problematic, such as the historic practice of refraining from informing terminally ill cancer patients about their prognosis on the grounds that this was in the patient's best interest. This was, was at one time and not that long ago standard practice, but would now be seen to conflict with a commitment to patient-centeredness, which places much greater value on patients being fully informed. The genetics professional committed to good practice is aware of the possibility that models of good practice can and do change, and that what seems like good practice today may turn out to look very different tomorrow. It's not a fact of change or concern about moral luck itself, which is the primary worry for the genetics professional. These are manifestations of a deeper concern. For the genetic professional concerned with the moral craft of genetics, the underlying problem with approaches to ethics which focus on conflict and disagreement or on the contingencies of day-to-day -day practice arises from her recognition that the fact that there is agreement about a particular practice or the fact that it's not emerged as unproblematic does not in itself provide an answer to the question of whether such practice is good or right or morally praiseworthy. But what this means for the genetic professional committed to moral to good practice is that what is that the practices which are often most in need of critical reflection are precisely those that are not widely seen as unproblematic, agreed, and stable. For this reason, the genetics professional who's committed to moral craftsmanship places particular value on the active seeking out of ethical problems. The genetics professional committed to doing a job, good job recognizes the value of developing skills such as moral deliberation, critical reflection, and the skills of moral judgment associated with moral craftsmanship and seeks out opportunities for those skills to be tested and challenged. But this can only go so far, of course. Whilst problem seeking is at the heart of the moral craft of genetics, any adequate account of the moral world of the genetics professional is also going to be one which recognizes the importance of relatively stable and unproblematic, unreflective practices and of the quotidian moral work by which they are sustained. The geneticist committed to moral craft understands that problem-seeking only makes sense as an activity in the context of at least some relatively stable practices. Not everything can be a problem, not only because this will be undermining of good practice, but also because problems are, um, only make sense at all in the context of broadly shared agreement in value judgments and in practices. Meaningful ethical problems emerge against the background of moral agreement and shared views about the moral work of genetics and its value. What this means, taken together, is that the genetics professional has to be skilled both at inhabiting the relatively stable, shared, unproblematized moral traditions underpinning good practice, and skilled too at the problem seeking through which such practices emerge as objects of moral ethical concern and as the subject of critical reflection. And this presents an important additional practical ethical difficulty for the genetics professional committed to the moral craft of genetics. But how should the judgment be made about when one or the other of these is required? Under what kinds of circumstances and in what situations should the genetics professional continue to inhabit the relatively stable, unproblematic moral traditions con constituting good practice? And when and in what kinds of situations should she view such practices as objects of ethical concern? This judgment is of real moral significance. For if the genetics professional is overly deferential to establish shared practices and habits, and to their maintenance through moral work, there's a risk of her practice becoming too conservative and unreflective, with all the implications discussed above. If, on the other hand, she adopts an approach which is too critical of established practices and experience, there's a danger of the breakdown of such practices and of a loss of confidence in the value of experiential and implicit knowledge of practice, knowledge and experience, expertise. Now, my experience of the cases presented for the discussion at the Genetics Club suggests that there can't be any single one-size-fits-all answers to the question of how such judgments should be made. And 
there can be no one unambiguous rule of thumb by which by means of which this judgment is to be guided in particular cases. And this shouldn't come as a surprise, I think. For there's no reason to believe that the emergence of the values and commitments by which good practice is informed as ethical objects of concern will be anything other than a complex value contextual. And there's every reason to believe that good, good judgment in such contexts will be greatly dependent upon the embedded practical wisdom of the experienced genetic professional committed to the moral craft of genetics. It's clear that practices and commitments can emerge as potential objects of concern in many different ways and with multiple durations and intensities, often partially incomplete, sometimes disappearing briefly only to re-emerge later in different form or in somewhat transformed context. And it is against this background that the experienced genetics professional committed to good practice, aware of the importance both of unreflective practices and of critical reflection, is called upon to practice this aspect of her moral craftsmanship. Wary of the lure of easy solutions, the experienced genetics professional committed to the moral craft of genetics sees an important and vital role for the continuation of an active and productive interplay between morals and ethics as a technique for ensuring that her practice is permeated by what might perhaps be called, thought of as a living morality. A mode of engagement with practice which makes it possible for both ethics and morals to be taken seriously. The genetics professional recognises that whilst the commitments underpinning every good practice will sometimes emerge as ethical objects of concern in their own way and in their own time, prompted perhaps by the inherent instability of practice, because practice is always rather tentative, or because moral work is only ever partially success successful in particular cases, the sustainability and indeed the vitality of the living morality at the heart of moral craftsmanship depends upon the genetics professional's own living commitment to the moral work of problem seeking. Now this starts to suggest an answer to the question with which I began, I think. The question was, why is it that the genetics club has been so popular with genetics professionals? Noting that the genetics professionals initially come along to the genetics club because they've got a particular ethical problem, a stumbling block or issue that they'd like to discuss with colleagues, why have so many of them continue to attend again and again, some, in some cases for many years, long after their problem has been resolved? It's clear that the genetics professionals who attend the genetics club share a deep commitment to doing their job well for its own sake, and recognise that this requires a commitment not only to good practice in the medical aspects of their day-to-day -day work, but also to what I've referred to as the moral craft of genetics. Against this background, sorry, against this background commitment to moral craftsmanship, my reflections of the last uh, three quarters of an hour or so have begun to hint at a rather surprising answer to the question of why genetics professionals continue to attend the genetics club. For it suggests that whilst genetics professionals might initially attend because they're looking for solutions to difficult cases, the reason they stay is because of the growing recognition of the importance of problems in the development and practice of moral craftsmanship. For the genetics professional committed to good practice, the genetics club has become valuable as a social space not only for the achievement of solutions, but also, perhaps even primarily, as a space for the production of problems. The genetics professional attends the genetics club because she recognises its value as a way of keeping her practice open and alive and of working to maintain a sustainable living morality. For this genetics professional, the genetics club has become a place not only of discussion and deliberation, but also a technique for unsettling everyday established stable practices in productive ways which facilitate the development of moral craftsmanship and the emergence of practical wisdom, which is, lies at the heart of good practice. I began by suggesting that it might be interesting to approach the ethics of genetics through a consideration of the implications of a commitment to do a job well for its own sake. That is, through an exploration of the idea of craftsmanship, and in particular, given that we're talking about ethics, of moral craftsmanship. Through my reflections on the genetics club and on why it is that genetics professionals might attend these meetings, despite the obvious constraints on their time, I hope to have shown you that the idea of moral craftsmanship does indeed offer an interesting and productive way of thinking about ethics and of understanding and engaging with the rich moral world of the genetics profession. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, of course.
Yeah, so this is uh, far outside of my field, so it's a very flat-footed question. But the, there's part of your talk that sounded to me very reminiscent of Aristotle in the sense that you have a moral craftsmanship that you can acquire by learning to make appropriate judgments and so it's becoming aware of the sort of moral aspects of the situation and being able to perceive those appropriately, perhaps only learned by apprenticeship or through yeah. seeing other people do so. But it wasn't, so the, I guess the question is, I take part of the point of the uh, second part of the talk was that you can challenge the sort of moral practice that arises by looking at these problematic cases and it sort of forces you into a second order assessment perhaps, um, or you know, uh, an assessment of those ways in which you become accustomed to perceive situations, either by facing up to situations in which you, you don't have a clear um, conclusion and then you sort of are then reflecting on the practices which were sort of led you to those assessments to begin with. But the question is, in what sense uh, do you see there being progress in the development of moral practice? So you say that there's a way in which it maintains a sort of living morality, but when you see people facing up to these challenges and you say that people in uh, the medical profession are particularly aware of how much uh, these practices have changed even within a generation, in what sense do you want to characterize them as sort of uh, progress that's been made or perhaps hasn't been made as people have faced up to these challenges and have, uh, you know, come to the genetics club and sort of continue to reflect on their practice in the way that you have? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, one, it might be worth saying something about how I got into this. Before I started the genetics club, I'd written you know, a number of papers about genetics, ethical issues in genetics, because I've been interested in, in, in actual particular problems. So one of the people I organized at the Genetics Club is a group of a geneticist called Annika Lucas, and, and we'd written papers about non-paternity and about sharing information in families, and we tended to do it by isolating a problem that seemed like worth thinking about, and then applying you know, particular kinds of moral ethical frameworks and principles to that, sort of arguing it through. And that's sort of the way that I've come at ethics in the past. And, but, the experience of doing the genetics stuff. I mean, at the beginning, I had this idea I might write a paper, a book, or something early on, but it, just time got in the way. And so 10 years went by, and I then found myself with nearly 300 cases and a lot of practical experience. I've been in all of these meetings and I've facilitated them and seen how they've changed. And when I came to write this book, I actually thought, well, this is that, right, just you know, having a series of cases and analyzing, analyzing those cases would miss something very important about what, what ethics, what morality is, what moral, moral yeah, what ethics and morals uh, are. And so in a sense, what's happened here is a kind of, doing a kind of, a, for me, a kind of meta-ethics in a way, sort of thinking about well, what, what is ethics, what is morality, and that's grown out of the experience. And you see that to some extent in this paper, which is the, you know, the first half is kind of descriptive kind of anal analysis, and the second half then shifts, in, shifts into a kind of normative, well, and, and, so, and it is, as you say, Aristotelian, I mean, it has, it does resonate with that. But and what it leads to, I think, potentially for me, is a kind of productive way of thinking about issues in the future. And the kind of issues that it's going to generate and problems for me to think about are things which are not, you know, um, so much to do with tensions between autonomy and better sense of concern for individuals. It's going to be about things like, um, you know, virtue, about have moral, moral, moral expertise, um, moral understanding. Shared practices, the development practices, and it raises exactly issues the ones you've raised about whether there can be progress. It seems to me that at the individual level, uh, you know, there is development. So people feel that they've got, they, they've become more effective at not only dealing, identifying dealing with problems, but also at the critical reflection. I wouldn't want to separate out the way you described it. it made it sound like I was saying, I probably expressed it poorly. That this kind of everyday practice and then critical reflection is kind of a, as you say, a sort of second order thing. I see it, although it has features of being second order, I see it, this is partly about what good practice is. Good practice has got critique built into it, but it's also got built into it quite, the sort of judgment of, oh, and that's appropriate or not. And I find that really interesting. I haven't certainly resolved that question, but I think there's an interesting question about that. In terms of moral pro progress more generally, I guess I wouldn't want to make any claims about that because I'm. I think I'm interested in yeah, what's actually happening in practice. I'm interested in education and training. Because that resonates with progress. But whether overall we're getting
thought that was great. Uh, uh, your um, description of the OR, for instance, and how a surgeon is trained seems to be a, a really nice uh, metaphor for uh, how you're trying to paint the picture of the clinical ethicist and trying to develop this, to cultivate this notion of practical wisdom when you're actually discussing issues with uh, the patient. Uh, so, so my question is, uh, what concrete ways do you see um, uh, institutes like the Robin Institute or Ethox uh, um, trying to uh, integrate uh, educational, uh, we're trying to integrate concrete ways to educate um, uh, students that are in the medical field and whatnot? How, how do you do that? Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple of things to say there. One thing is to say that although this is a different way into ethics, I, th I mean, I think it, for me, it feels very exciting and interesting, and I'm really to do more of it. I'm not suggesting that thinking about ethical theories of other kinds, for example, or thinking about moral principles and arguments and how they work is, is relevant. So I, I think moral education and, and the ways in which, you know, when I'm the geneticist in this talking about problems, they'll often use concepts like autonomy or, you know, beneficence or. Use, approach things in kind of utilitarian uh, ways. So I think people need to, need, need to know about these things. I'm not saying that any of that stuff is redundant, so I do think that. But I do think it does suggest um, a kind of a more practice-based approach to that, to, to moral education. So I guess with medical students it might be either discussing cases, doing teaching on the ward, um, and that kind of thing as the, as the primary focus, and then perhaps having kind of more abstract sessions, you know, uh, to back that up. But I'm certainly not, I mean, I'm back, by background I'm a philosopher, so I'm not going to argue that, that moral theory and philosophy are irrelevant here. I do think those need to be taught. But I do think, you know, it's become apparent to me over this time that what counts us, uh, as what's going on here is something that's, that's very interesting, and we miss, we miss a lot if we just focus on fairly abstract cases being addressed through, you know, tensions between deontology and consequentialism. I uh, was thinking about uh, your answer to Chris, but one of the things, uh, this, the cases, that, the, the two cases you described, and then your picture of the uh, genetics club and their meetings, indicated a kind of uh, uh, people working on similar problems and using the insights that they can get from each other, uh, it would be quite surprising to me if this uh, application of trying to <coughs> figure things out with the details wouldn't be something that would produce, I mean, Socrates talks about wisdom as opposed to knowledge. And I suspect that a way, I mean, one, one way to kind of indicate progress would be to look at a, a context where you've got the advantage of a group like this, try to do this to help each other do better, and compare it to, a, to another place where that's not available. And then just look at the cases and the way they've developed and see whether you couldn't make a, I bet you that the, uh, it would be possible to get a lot of evidence that things are better done when you have this kind of people who are trying very hard to help each other to get the relevant wisdom. Yeah. One of the things that's been interesting about the genetics study is the way in which it's led. I mean, I, I do mostly organize, you know, I mostly organizing and I advertise it and that kind of thing. But I do, I do the running of the session with three geneticists, two genetic professors who are clinicians, and a genetic counselor who's a, got a PhD in ethics and is very interested in this study. But the fact that they give up their time, they've been there the whole time, the fact that it, it suggests that it's kind of of value to them in some way. Um, and I, yeah, so you can have those personal stories, or you can do a comparison. The one thing that's interesting about what you just said is, well, it's the, the way in which difference, people agree to differ as well, so it doesn't necessarily lead to a shared answer. We said one reason for setting up the Genetics Club was because it would, uh, or setting up the initial meeting was because there was, we, in the UK we have 23 regional genetic centres, so 
anyone who knows the technical genetics goes to one of these centers. They cover large areas, so the one in Oxford has, covers a population of about 5 million people, something like that, so they're quite big. But what, it became apparent pretty early on that they do different, they often do different things in the same situation. So the, the first case, the one with the twins, for example, the majority of they're all trying to convince people to talk to their family members. But if that doesn't work, the majority of them will give the test to the person in the clinic because they feel they should have their right to access to testing they shouldn't depend on their family members. And you can imagine even more problematic situations where, for example, it's a test during, re during pregnancy and it's about whether someone gets access to abortion or not. So, you know, so the tendency in most clinics is to give the test. But the one clinic, which is a big one covering a large area, which, which doesn't do that. So it became apparent quite early on that actually there were variations in practice that were important. And we had this idea that by getting people to talk, there might be some sort of agreement about what counts as good practice. And that is important in the UK context, and I don't know how it works in Canada, but it's important in the UK context because the law takes very seriously what professionals think of as good practice. So if you, if you get sued for not sharing information, then one of the tests will be what do your colleagues do. So if the, if the genetics club reaches agreement about something, that could be quite good, but it could also be quite damaging for people. But actually what's happened is that in some of these cases there's been a discussion, there's been lots of critical reflection, and then they've said, well actually we're going to carry on doing what we do. Uh, for these reasons, and you, you, the other guy's going to carry on doing something else. So it hasn't always, so progress, I wouldn't want to identify progress necessarily, but everyone agreed to do the same thing. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, but in some cases it, it, it should, I think. In some cases there, there ought to be it ought to be possible to read some kind of green. Anyway, I'm around with the so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question about collaboration. So it's very clear that moral work and moral practice is uh, relational. But I wonder, and it's clear from what you said, that um, the groups like the genetics group that does ethics together facilitates moral craftsmanship. But I wonder if that collaboration makes you a better craftsman than someone who just sits at home and seeks problems and answers problems on their own. Is there something about the collaboration that is always going to be better than problem seeking and solving on your own? That is really good. I mean, that's to some extent an empirical kind of question. Because you know, I think that I thought what I've tried to do is identify some elements of moral craftsmanship. <coughs> Well, gender free, gender neutral version of that, or whatever it is, moral craft. Um, what, uh, so, for example, and, so, and one of those, for example, is this living morality idea that there's a kind of thing to play, keeping, keeping things open. So, and I don't see any reason why the moral development, or if that's the right word, should, should only have one part. I, I think that you know, it will be possible for people to do it in different ways. I personally am kind of quite a social person, I suppose, and I would tend to see. For me, at least, the group thing would work well. It obviously works well for the people who come along. But there's no reason why you shouldn't do that by just being a very much, a much more reflective, kind of introverted person or someone who reads books about these things. So I wouldn't want to be prescriptive about that. I, what I want to say is that this is one example of a way in which it's worked for a particular group of people. Um, yeah, I think I wouldn't want to go any further than that. Though. I'm, I'm, my PhD was actually, before I became interested in ethics, my PhD was on the philosophy of psychology. And I've learned theories of learning, and one of the things I think is really important is that we avoid ideas that learning only comes back in one way. I think it's important that we accept and acknowledge the possibility of people learning different ways. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to have to sort of jump the queue yeah. a bit here and just insert my own, my own <laughs> question. My question is this I mean, why do they need you? I mean, what, what is it that, that you're doing in, in this? I mean, it's something you haven't said much about. I mean, um, I'm guessing your role is actually quite crucial as a philosopher. And I guess I'm inviting you to um, reflect a bit on what is it that, that, that you're doing. Is it, is it, you know, are you helping them sort of get clearer on their reasoning? Is there something, um, does it matter that you're not a geneticist? Does it matter that you, you bring an outside perspective? I mean, what, what, what is it that, that, that you're bringing? And that's changed. I mean, that's one of the things I've seen. In my, I've changed as a philosopher. And I've, in, this, in this book that I uh, just got me, I've got a, a chapter in there where I just reflect, try to reflect on, on that. And, so, and it's sort of, I'm interested in it partly because of what it brings to, to the meeting, but also 
the book essentially is a kind of ethnography because I, you know, so much of it is based on experience of sitting in the room and keeping notes like that. So I've changed as a researcher as well as hopefully contributing to it. One thing I do which is not, you know, unimportant is that I book the rooms and I organize the food and I send out the emails. So there's, there's, there have certainly been times when I've kept it going. On the other hand, there have been times, there have been 30 meetings, I've attended every meeting, and there have been times when I've been trying to kind of hand it over to other people, and I've said, well, I, well I'm not going to come to this one, or there's been a clash, and they've always said, well, let's change the date, so and I've never been able to get out. <laughs> so, and I, and I don't believe that's, partly that's about them being nice, and partly it's about the lunches, but <laughs> I think they do sometimes see my roles as country. So no, I, I tend to be a fairly kind of quiet, low-key person in meetings. I'm not some, I don't talk very much. And even in these situations, I don't. So I, it's mostly about allowing them to talk, facilitating and encouraging. Uh, and so I'll often play the role of saying, well, tell me a bit more about that. And of course, I'll, uh, that will draw my experience, my, the reading I've done, the philosophy that I've done, and the, and the time I spent in genetics clinic. So part of it's about asking questions. Sometimes I play an active role in this, the, what I call here the living morality. So sometimes there'll be a, they'll reach a solution too quickly. Uh, and I'll say, well, hang on a second, what about this? And I'll, I'll ask them, you know, about other views, other ways that people think that. Or I'll play the role of the patient and I'll say, look, come on, you know, you know you're telling me you're going to let me about this clinic without, any, without telling me about this condition. Um, and so I've been provocative of them in those kinds of ways. And I think that's, that's uh, been useful. And sometimes I've used, I've used, you know, I've tended to think, well, and there is a philosophical background in the sense of fairly naive kind of one, which is, well, they haven't thought about the harms very much. So, well, they haven't, they've talked about harms and benefits, but they haven't thought about people's rights or their obligations. So I just tend to chip in a few. And I think that's opened up a discussion in, which, in ways which I think is a relief for the people who are really interested in getting into discussion, because I think it helps keep things open in a way that's productive. Yes, that's, yeah, that's it. But it is, I mean, I, before I became an academic, uh, I used to run a hostel for homeless teenagers. So for 10 years I ran a hostel in central London. And I spent a lot of time providing, essentially providing counselling for teenagers who were fighting about stuff. Or family, families, you know, who came to visit their, their children and were, and a lot, and that kind of group, and when I think about what, whether I draw more on my PhD or on my experience there, quite often I think I'm actually, that was the more valuable of the two experiences. So, so you know, that's kind of a group work. Yeah. I had a similar question. I just like the way you sort of set things up with ethics and, and with the background morality. And, but my question was sort of like, Charles, what's the role for the philosopher? Like, what skills in particular does a philosopher possess that she or he would be able to contribute uh, to the sort of story that you told? Yeah. I mean, because on, on, one, on one interpretation, this doesn't need a philosopher at all. Essentially, you can imagine a group of professionals who just get together to talk about ethics. Um, I guess they would need a certain amount of thing to have done a certain amount of reading and thinking about these things. So, hardly wants to say, but not for, uh, let's say that actually the, the philosopher is irrelevant, you know, is not that important. It, it's in, what's important is that the critical, the sort of Aristotelian, you know, the critical thinking is going on and that people are reflecting on their practice and that sort of thing. So, I don't think the philosopher is necessary in, 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 in a kind of ideal world. But I do think that in practice, I mean, this, this wasn't happening before and it isn't happening anywhere else in the UK. Um, so I think my interest, motivation has kind of made a difference, and that came from my interest in trying to get a richer sense of what these philosophical problems were about. But I do, I do think I bring, I do think I bring a kind of richness to their discussion, that they, that they, they bring it to me for of all their practical concerns and so on. But I think my philosophical reading uh, you know, I can say, see, well, Aristotle would have said this, or you know, and that makes that makes a difference. And I can, I can, I can uh, impose a kind of encourage a kind of discipline about argument. For example, I can, I get them sometimes very rarely. I'll say, I'll okay, say, well, let's write that argument out. So you know, these are the premises of the, the argument. This is the conclusion. Is that is that what you're saying? Uh, so there's a kind of dis there's a kind of discipline. But, I'm also aware of with, with Richard Gorty on this in the sense that there are lots of other disciplines that use argument. You know, historians make argue about the origins of the Industrial Revolution, present arguments 
criticize each other arguments and, uh, in the same way that philosophers do science. I don't want to put philosophers out of business because I do think what I do and what we do is valid, but I don't think, if I'm honest, the philosoph philosophical part of me has had, in, in, the, in the usual sense of the word, apart from perhaps in the Socratic kind of being a bit of a gadfly in that situation, being critical of easily, easy assumptions and agreements, challenging people a bit. I mean, you might think you sort of drew a picture of what reflective equilibrium might look like, and so what you've done for the next focus on the idea that really what's important is this notion of judgment that occurs or what you need when you have conflicts between yeah. principles and individual yeah. cases and uh, you know, what to do with what that ripple effect is for your background on set of attitudes and then wondering about what to do with the background of things. Yeah. Uh, that, that so you can kind of impose a different kind of discipline, a kind of conceptual discipline, which is this is, this is what kind of reasoning you're doing and, and then you might from that answer partly Chris's question about what progress consists in what consistent kind of greater coherence. Yeah. Which need mean consensus because there could be different coherent bodies of ethical uh, knowledge that <coughs> seem to be equally well justified. Like in the cases that you gave where some people say we should convince them to tell the family and some people don't and yeah. things of that nature. I think that's right. It has a this obviously has a lot in common with, with the at least the practice has a lot in common with reflective equilibrium. Yeah. Um, it has a lot in common to uh, with the idea of the word the words living morality come from junction lovers causing death and saving lives where you've got this chapter about what what, the, you know, what keeping morality alive, which I really like. Richard Sennett's got something very similar in his Craftsman book about science and about craft. Dewey has similar ideas. It's a sort of so but I would want to I guess I would want to say that it's not not it's a it's more rich, I guess, than the idea of just print, go from principles and yeah, okay, so yeah, yeah. It's, but it's it's similar. It's a similar sort of issues, yeah, things, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, I really like uh, Dewey's paper of what's it called three um, three independent um, variables or something. I can't remember. But he talks about sort of virtue, deontology, and consequentialism as essentially being they're all they're all random. You can't resolve them, but you that that you kind of need to resolve them in particular cases through this kind of process. Thank you. 
I need to get on with my research. Why am I doing this genetics? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, I should be writing papers. I, I want to criticize, you know, Julian Savaleski's ideas on protein beneficence, or I, you know, or, or, you know, people writing about research ethics I might want to engage with, that kind of stuff. Why am I doing this? And I came to, I came to the view of kind of when I started writing this up, I thought I'd write it up and that would get it out of the way. But as I started writing it up, I started thinking, actually, I, this is research. I'm doing... I'm doing moral theory, but it's a different kind of it's a different kind of moral theory. It's a moral theory which is broadly speaking is kind of Aristotelian, kind of Jewy type. It's not pragmatic because it's not pragmatic. I think ethic, morality, moral, morals is kind of a weak weak point of pragmatism, but it's kind of got things in in common with that. So, so I, so I think it is moral theory, but I know I know I know what you mean. Um, it's quite interesting. So the writing up doesn't it, it isn't moral theory in the way you expect, but the discussions often are moral theory. You know, the, the conversations with people in the group, some of them at least, in fact quite a few of them, you know, they've gone away and they've read stuff and they'll say, Well, can you explain uh, rule utilitarian, rule consequences and whatever it is for me? And let's have a you know, have a discussion about it. And how does it relate to the cases we've just talked about? So there'll be a kind of theory in which which I haven't written up could be more interested in this. So yeah, my, my view about, I think it raises questions related to your, so your, your question about what role does it play raises questions about education to what we should be teaching. Because there is, a, there is a kind of worrying implication of this potentially, which is that, well, people should be just kind of, maybe the philosopher should just chip in and encourage them to do this, but basically there's nothing particularly, you know, there's no particular set of skills here or, but yeah, but I, I want to defend, I, I think maybe that's the next stage, to make an argument about what the role of philosophy and theory is in this kind of, this kind of situation. But you know, it may, may end up being the kind of stuff that, you know, uh, I mean, there are a lot of people who, who draw on Aristotelian and right? I mean, you know, think about people like Charles Taylor or Alison McIntyre and so on, who've written about theory in these kinds of ways, at least. So, I wouldn't say it was, I don't think it isn't moral theory, but it isn't, certainly isn't the kind of moral theory that I used to be. Question. Oh, please uh, join me. Thank you.